This is a response to uh, an interesting question posed to me by Phoenix Chastain. Um, I'll leave a link below to her video. It's just asking me a question, a couple of questions. Uh, and it's in the vein of, I guess, um, what I was talking about in terms of acedia and motivation and how or why one does anything that one ever does. Anything. Ever. Why do you get out of bed in the morning? Um, what's your motive? Are you listening to something that is driving you out of bed? Something, some, something that you have to obey that makes you extremely weary, and the only response to it is acedia. Or are you going? Are you going out into bed? Uh, going out into the world by leaving your bed? Instead of being driven out of your bed in the morning, are you getting up and? actively moving into something else as opposed to coming out of a nice place. The same act, two completely different um, actions, as it were, in terms of motivation. Do you get out of bed because the inner critic kicks you out of bed, as it were, saying, get out of bed, you lazy bastard, uh, this voice telling you, you have to do something, don't waste your life, uh, or do you wake up in the morning and say, I want to be awake. Even though last night I really wanted to be asleep. It, sleep was a wonderful thing that I wanted to do and now I want to be awake because all, there's all kinds of things to do and things that I want to do. Not stuff that I'm driven to do, stuff that I want to do. That's the sort of the nexus of, or uh, that's an improper use of the term nexus, I guess you'd call it axis of acedia and um, the inner critic versus what I would call healthy desire, which is something that I'm, uh, I deliberately seek to inculcate in myself, or to cultivate, I suppose. Now her question is this, if you had the ability to, I guess, snap your fingers and stop everybody in the world in their tracks, stop them from moving, as it were, um, for three days, 72 hours or whatever, um, what would you do, or would you do it, and why, I guess? Or what would you do? Now, it's very interesting because I, I see the tie-in. I got the tie-in right away um, between uh, with that and um, motivation, fundamental motivation for existence, for living. What is it that animates you? Is it a desire to go out and do things? Or is it, are you driven to do things because the consequences of not doing them are severe? In other words, is your motivation positive or negative in every way? Um, <clears throat> and I think that people divide along those two lines. I think some people just, the kind of person that you speak to who, say, who says they just drag themselves through life, that they're, they're basically just trying to avoid the inner critic. Um, whereas, you know, someone with um, acedia, I guess, has sort of, said, never mind, inner critic, I just don't have the strength to resist you anymore. I'll lay here in a fetal ball and let life happen to me. Um, and there are, of course, alternatives to both of these, to both acedia and anxiety. Um, I'm currently reading two books right now at the same time. Now, it's just pure coincidence that they turned out, this, that they, they turned out to be sort of so similar in a, in a way. Uh, one of them is called... Um, Against Nature. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting book. I'm gonna I forgot the uh, the title's name or the uh, author's name. Uh, it's um, it's uh, Arebour. Uh, it's a French novel, and it's uh, written by Joris Karl Hausmans. <laughs> Uh, in spite of his extremely Flemish or Dutch-sounding name, he's actually French. Uh, it's about an aristocratic Frenchman of the late 19th century who has become so jaded with absolutely everything. In other words, he's, he was, in his early part of his youth, he was a, an extreme voluptuary who, you know, liked wine, women, and song, and all that kind of thing. Blew a pile of his fortune, um, wasted his time in complete and utter dissipation. And eventually he just sort of says, all right, enough of this. And he tries to create inside of his own house, a, quite a large house, a mansion, really, a gigantic mansion. 
He wants to create his own self-contained little universe where everything is perfect. Uh, he goes to the extent of padding all the walls with expensive tapestries to muffle any sounds from one room to another. He sets the rooms up in such a way that, for example, the smells from the kitchen cannot reach where he's actually going to eat because he wants to understand the subtle differences in smell between no food in the room and food in the room. Um, he pays lavish attention to the color scheme in his uh, various apartments in this large house that he lives in. <clears throat> um, he has everything perfectly free to hand. Every painting in his house is carefully selected so that he can contemplate it. Um, and he doesn't produce anything or have any contact with any other human beings, if possible, ever. He has a few servants, um, as any noble one, nobleman would have in the 19th century. But basically, he's trying to get a world in which he has absolutely no trouble or no complications and no distress. Uh, it's interesting. It's the it's the last man, really. It's um, a guy whose only purpose is to float around in, I guess, some sort of Schopenhauerian state of contemplation of everything. And it's interesting because the the implication is this is going to lead him to acedia. Um, now, I haven't finished either of these two books, so that's an interesting one. Um, and then there's another one it's um, called The Purple Cloud it's a science fiction novel uh, where, whereby a guy goes to the North Pole and while he's at the North Pole this purple cloud of gas some sort of gas comes out and gases, asphyxi asphyxiates the entire human race <laughs> um, while he's up at the North Pole and the fact that he's at the North Pole somehow saves his life um, so he goes back into the world and he sees these scenes of appalling carnage and destruction that kind of bring to mind the uh, scenes of the devastation wrought upon New York City by Captain Tripps in the uh, Captain Tripps being this pandemic in um, Stephen King's novel The Stand. Really interesting stuff. Uh, both of these novels, by the way, are quite bizarre. They're not like any other novels you're, li you're likely to read, but they also deal. See, he's now this guy is. And the main character in, in The Purple Cloud is also kind of a last man. He's literally the mass, last man on Earth. He has the world to himself. He can do anything he likes. Nobody's there to stop him, ever. And it, being also around the turn of the 19th and 20th century, he has access to all the modern technology. He's kind of snapped his fingers, and there are no more people. thing is, there's skeletons everywhere, or rotting flesh at the beginning, everywhere. Um, but... After a while, the purple cloud has dissipated, and he's the only person on Earth. So he goes to Constantinople, he becomes the Sultan of Turkey, he dresses up like the Sultan, he spends his days smoking his hookah, sitting in a large poof, um, you know, wearing a huge turban, um, and he, whenever he just feels like it, he torches an entire metropolis. He'll completely torch, say, Beijing, burn it to the ground, and go to enormous lengths to do so. Um, goes to various arsenals to get gunpowder, to get flammables and stuff like this, spends days arranging it, and then, boom, watches these great metropolises like uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, London, or whatever, burn massive symphonies of flame and destruction. Why does he do it? He never explains. Um, I guess it's just the sheer atavistic wow of it all, burning things. Um, and he's you know, gets fat, he eats nothing but the choicest foods, smokes wonderful, the best tobacco, drinks the finest wines, but he doesn't, again, just like the guy in Arabo, he doesn't turn to gross voluptu voluptuism, I guess. He doesn't become an alcoholic or a drug addict. He gets fat, but that's, you know, it's more and more, um, in the 19th century sense, a fat, contented person. Um, and, you know, it's just what does he do with a world that is completely and suddenly devoid of all people? I haven't finished either one. I'm reading both at the same time I do that. Um, it's an interesting thought. Um, 
two people just confronted with the riddle of existence in and of itself. Nothing to distract you, or far less. Uh, there's no other people out there. You're stuck with yourself. One guy deliberately cuts himself off, another guy finds himself in a circumstance where he is cut off. Neither actually fall prey to out-and-out -out despair. They still seem to want to stay alive. And they actually, in some weird way, each one enjoys his own life. Um, there's elements of, um, I guess you'd call it antinatalism in both novels as well, because there's a certain sterility implied in both of these people, because you know one guy can't breathe, the other guy refuses. Um, and you know you get into the head of the guy who's in the purple cloud, who's you know in the world where everyone has been killed. He's thinking along those lines. Would I actually repopulate the earth if I had the choice? Hmm, it's interesting. And throughout the purple cloud, throughout the novel, there's this idea of the conflict between the forces of light and darkness, black and white, etc. All issues, both of these novels are issues raised in Phoenix Chastain's question. Um, what would I do? Well, I would probably want to do that. I would probably want to stop the world, you know, like that Twilight Zone episode from the 1950s. I'd love that. Um, somehow, flip a switch, everybody freezes. What I would probably do, I would probably do something along the lines of the guy in, um, in the purple cloud. I would probably go to some place like, I don't know, Varanasi in India, or um, maybe even Rome or Paris or something like this, although Rome and Paris don't seem to be themselves unless there's mobs of people everywhere, but some place with imposing architecture, impressive ruins of the past, etc., and I'd flip my switch. And I would probably do pretty much what the guy in the purple cloud did. I'd probably, uh, say, go into Chez Maxime in Paris, pick up the food that has just been prepared to you know, be served to somebody who's just paid, say, $20,000 for a meal. I would eat that very slowly and deliberately, washed down with wine that might cost eighteen thousand dollars a bottle. Um, you know, although eh, I probably wouldn't be able to hold down the wine, but you know, you know what I mean. It basically just enjoy all the crazy luxuries that I don't really feel like pursuing normally. They don't even really interest me. But s since they're available without um, price, as it were, without the effort necessary of obtaining them, I would do all of that. Um, Ironically, just like in both novels, I don't think I'd be inclined to take sexual advantage of frozen women. Um, it wouldn't, you know, I, I don't think that that would really be that important uh, to what I was, you know, to this state of being in a frozen universe or frozen world or where people are just frozen in their tracks or whatever. Um, I might go for a joyride in a Lamborghini or something like that. I might... Um, climb to the top of uh, the Eiffel Tower and paint the entire thing, uh, the entire tip of the Eiffel Tower, some fluorescent pink and paint my name on it or blue or something just to say somebody's been here and they've truly left their mark on the world or whatever. Uh, I don't think I'd destroy anything. Um, I don't think I'd want to do that. <clears throat> I might correct something if it didn't uh, involve a lot of work. As I say, repaint the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Actually, that would probably take more than three days for one person to do. But you know what I mean. I'd like to sort of leave my mark. That would kind of be neat to do. Um, and since, you know, there's a, not that much of a time frame, and I might have to actually account for what I'd actually done while the world was frozen, uh, especially if I left a personalized mark, um, I would make sure I didn't damage things too much. Um, now, you know, the, in the Twilight Zone episode, there's all this uh, idea that, you know, something could go wrong. The guy in Twilight Zone, he had a stopwatch that stopped time, and he broke the watch, and he was stuck forever with everybody frozen there. You know, I don't know if that's implied in Phoenix Chastain's uh, um, what-if scenario. Like, what if you got stuck there? What if you did actually freeze everybody forever, and you're just there by yourself, and you are the last man? Um... No, I, I don't know. Maybe that's a risk, in which case I probably wouldn't even initiate the entire process. I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to stop the wheel of existence, as it were, uh, completely in its tracks, the way some people, I guess, might actually want to stop the universe from universing. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I would do it. I would do it, and I'd be fascinated. I might just spend all three days sitting on the roof of 
say, St. Peter's Basilica, staring out at Rome or something like that, or the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, or, I don't know, the Escorial in, uh, in Madrid, or the Taj Mahal, something like that. I don't know what I would actually do, but I would, I would probably want to be able to plan it in advance, and I'd probably do something that would be, would strike me as a profound thing to do, or a profound place to be, especially under those circumstances. Uh, I had, I've actually one of the few people that actually had an experience, a very small amount like that. Uh, in 1989, I was in India, and there was communal rioting and killing and everything between the Hindus and the Muslims, so the city was under lockdown, martial law. Um, nobody was allowed to go anywhere. And this is in Agra in India, which is a city, I believe, is evenly split between Hindus and Muslims, so when they sort of get at each other's throats, uh, it really hits Agra hard. So Agra is where the Taj Mahal is. Once, for about four hours, I had... I was the only person in the grounds of the Taj Mahal. Well, I wasn't the only one. There was me and a Norwegian guy. And it was under the full moon. And I had the Taj Mahal basically to myself for four hours at night with it glowing under the full moon, which it was designed to do. Um, an experience of a lifetime, I guess. Uh, in hindsight, it strikes me as unbelievably rare and kind of similar to that. Uh, the Taj Mahal is one of those places that's simply crawling with tourists all the time. If you've ever been to, say, the Acropolis in Athens, or, um, say, um, um, right in front of uh, Westminster, Big Ben in London, it's one of those places that you simply can't imagine unless it's full of tourists. Well, imagine that place completely deserted. Otherwise normal, and you know there are people there, but they're all cleared off the street, they're all confined to their buildings, except you. <laughs> You're allowed to roam freely in these places. What would you do? Um, well, I kind of had a small piece of that, uh, a taste of that experience in India in 1989, and it was quite an experience. Um, it takes on the element of a peak experience because you sort of go, wow, this is something I will never, nobody ever gets to do and I'll never have this again and I have to enjoy it now. So there's even a little bit of anxiety involved. It's not a fully pleasurable experience and it's slightly frightening. Um, but I would do it again um, to have the world, as it were, um, at my command in a way. None of the people in it, but everything else is mine just for three days. Uh, I'd do it. I wouldn't destroy anything. I'd probably try a whole bunch of things. I'd probably try to whip around on a souped-up uh, Ducati motorcycle uh, along the curving highways north of Los Angeles or something like that. Or, you know, just these kinds of experiences that you, you, nobody ever really gets to do, but we'd all like to do it. Um, that's what I would do. I don't think I'd try to do any... I wouldn't try to alter the world. I wouldn't use a nuclear bomb to try and, I don't know change things, you know, to try and say, okay, I'm a surgeon now, I get to change the world. I wouldn't attempt that. Um, I certainly wouldn't attempt to kill anybody or anything like that. Or, But that's a tough one, though. What would, How would I be affected by the ability to snap my fingers and stop stop the world? What would it, what would it make me think of myself? Would it corrupt me the way, as they say, power corrupts? Because that would be an awful lot of power. Um, in... Um, the purple cloud, the guy, it is implied the guy is badly corrupted by the fact that he's the last person on earth because he goes around destroying things um, and feeling absolutely no pity for all the people that had died. Um, but I don't know. I don't think I would be corrupted by that, but I could be. But it's an interesting thought. It tells you an awful lot about yourself, doesn't it? And it tells you an awful lot about your view of what um, existence both is and from your own perspective in as much as there are any shoulds, what it should be. Ideally, what, what do you want your existence to be? Interesting litmus test. Thanks for the question, Phoenix.